<laughs> Hello and welcome to the 10th annual University of Guelph Sustainable Restaurant Project. We're live, live streaming. We have people joining us, hopefully from all over the world, and a good in-house audience as well. Uh, we're going to start today's proceedings with a land acknowledgement, and if I could ask uh, Emily Robinson, please. Yeah. Of course. So um, obviously the conversations that we're going to be having today are a lot about food and about sustainability as well. Um, and it would be um, very um, inappropriate of us not to acknowledge that uh, the people that we should be gathering a lot of that knowledge from are the Indigenous peoples who have lived in this land for a very long time themselves. Um, so we want to acknowledge the First Nations Inuit Métis people who have um, lived in this area for many generations and will continue to as well. Um, this area that we Thank you, Emily. And before we introduce our speakers and get to our program, I would just like to uh, invite our Assistant Dean, Audrey Janelle, up to give a welcoming from the Dean's Office and the Lang School of Business and Economics. Thanks, Bruce. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here with all of you. I really appreciate that land acknowledgement. I talk a lot about that in my class in terms of the definition of sustainability, of taking what you need and making sure there's still space for others to have what they need. So I really appreciate that opening today. Um, so on behalf of the University of Guelph and the Gordon S. Lang School of Business and Economics, really happy to welcome you all here today to the University of Guelph Sustainable Restaurant Project Symposium. Special warm welcome to our external guests. You have a beautiful day to be on campus, so welcome to all of you. Um, collaborations with you and your businesses are really at the heart of what we do in so many of our programs here, and it's great to have you. This project was first started in 2011 with the goal of advancing sustainability in the food service industry through both education and research. And since its inception, the project's done really well. Um, it's helped create sustainability curriculum for hospitality students. It's worked to improve sustainability in the University of Guelph student-run restaurant PJs. And students and faculty have also worked on countless research projects um, and food, ser with food service operators. And each year we hold a symposium with prominent speakers. Uh, and today uh, is the 10th one. Congratulations. That's a huge milestone. I remember when the project first started. <coughs> Uh, you know, at the university, our mission is to improve life, and in Lang School, we also talk about business as a force for good in the world. And I think this project really in, empowers it and speaks to both of those principles. So I'm excited for to hear from our three speakers today, and they all happen to be graduates of the Lang School, which is wonderful. Um, it's great to hear from them today about their research and their advocacy and how they're working to solve challenges in the food service industry. So to our industry leaders, I hope that today's session proves fruitful and you get some new ideas and sparks some new discussions. And thanks for inviting me to join you today. We Thank you. Thank you. Now, we also, before we start, just want to recognize a few sort of long-term collaborators uh, to the project um, who have, uh, have really made things happen and, and and keep things moving forward. I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce Michael Masso, who was my, uh, when he was in our, our school, uh, before he went over to the dark side at OAC, um, was uh, ran the project with me for many years. And uh, uh, so thank you, Mike, for all your contributions, as well as uh, Planet Bean um, Coffee, uh, Bill's here, Court from um, Neighborhood Group of Restaurants, and also uh, Earl's Restaurants, uh, who have been um, all supporters and collaborators with us over the years, and uh, we really appreciate um, their support. Um, our three speakers tonight are all grads, as Audrey said. Uh, two of them just completed this year their Master of Science degrees and, and defended their thesis in uh, April and May of this year, so well done, and they've stayed on and working for us now at the university. And the third, uh, Kyla, uh, who I'll introduce a little later, is with Unilever Food uh, Service Solutions and was a marketing grad from a few years ago and uh, is their uh, ambassador for Fair Kitchens as well. So they're going to present about some of our industry's most challenging uh, topics that we're facing now. Like everyone in this room knows what, what those are. And 
Uh, for Emily and Rebecca, it's going to be sort of a combination of what they did on their thesis for two years and worked on, as well as um, research projects that the three of us have worked together as a team for the last two years. So as well as doing their thesis, um, we've also worked on uh, many projects and been speaking to industry uh, for the last two years. So uh, without any further delay, I will introduce Emily Robinson, and she's going to be speaking um, about sustainability and Emily. Hey. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. And I know maybe some people will trickle in as we get started, but that's all right. I know we're all very busy, so I really appreciate everyone being here with us today. Um, and as Bruce mentioned, basically the presentation um, that I'm going to focus on and that um, my colleague Rebecca is going to focus on as well is over the last couple of years, um, we've really dived into a lot of important topics in the service industry. Lots of these things are, are kind of topics that we that sparked interest in in our time working in the industry. Um, and when we pursued our Master of Science, it's because we were really, really passionate about kind of bridging that research um, with industry as well. So this is a really nice kind of full circle moment um, for myself and I'm sure for Rebecca as well to be able to just share with you all what we learned. Um, maybe you find something useful from it. Uh, maybe you don't, but at the very least, we're very happy to have you here and, and, and happy to share with you um, what we were able to learn over the last two years. So... Um, what I'm talking about more specifically is trying to move that needle on environmental sustainability in food service. So trying to overcome the barriers to implementing environmental sustainability initiatives. So what is an environmentally sustainable restaurant? The issue is we don't really know. Um, there have been a lot of attempts at definitions over the years. And what we found when we really dove into the research um, was uh, there's a lot of conflicting opinions. Um, a lot of people say one thing, many people say another. Um, there was kind of this, this huge development around, you're welcome to come in. <laughs> yeah. um, there was kind of this huge development around um, sustainable development as terminology um, back in the 1980s with the release of the Brundtland Report. Um, and many, many industries really wanted to adopt uh, sustainable development into their repertoire. Um, and it was kind of this great inspiring, you know, yes, we're going to continue to, to blaze ahead and, and become profitable industries, um, but with this emphasis on sustainability. Uh, but there was never really a concrete kind of guidebook on what that's supposed to look like in practice. Um, in terms of food service more specifically, um, a lot of people look to say Alice Waters with Shape Nice and kind of that, that introduction, introduction to sustainability in a restaurant and what that can look like. Um, but, but again, still, we, we, we haven't really narrowed down exactly what that is meant to be. So, as I said, there are some things that are some ways that we try to define it, define it over the years. Um, in particular, a lot of people accept the definition of when we're talking about uh, sustainability and environmental sustainability in particular, we're talking about meeting the needs of the present without compromising future generations to meet their own needs. This is maybe a definition that lots of us have already heard, um, one that gets thrown around in, in, in a lot of different contexts. Um, there's also the definition of considering seven generations ahead. So in everything that you do in your work, I consider how that's going to be affecting the next seven generations, or we say that's approximately 150 years. Um, and this is a mentality that a lot of indigenous, indigenous peoples will adopt as well. So kind of referring back to that land acknowledgement and, and referring back to how we're trying to, um, you know, to encompass that knowledge and, and take it forward um, and kind of look to them as, as leaders as well. And then there's also a lot of, um, kind of buzzwords or kind of kind of more general definition around things like regeneration and replenishment and renewal and recycling and kind of just this this constant going back to redoing something and bringing something back into the same system. Um, so kind of getting this image of, of a circular system um, is what we get a lot of the time as well. Um, so one of the things I was able to do over the last couple of years is um, take a fellowship with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on Circular Economy. So I want to touch really briefly on kind of what that might look like in the context of sustainability and more specifically sustainability in food service. So generally when we're talking about that kind of regenerative definition and talking about circularity, we're talking about the process of designing out waste. So not just thinking about ways to eliminate waste, but thinking of, of more kind of strategic design procedures of how we can get waste out of the system, or alternatively, take that waste and turn it into something new, whether that's for a different industry or for a different sector of your own industry. So in the context of a restaurant, we're talking about things like plastic waste, food waste, energy waste, basically any 
your business is leaking. So we talk about these kind of leaky bits of a business and, and where things are, are falling out the other side and where we can kind of reincorporate those things into the system. So typically, um, we live in a linear economy, and that's what we talk about is this, this line from gathering resources, using them for a specific uh, utility, and then we kind of dispose of them at the end. And that's the typical you know, way things have always operated. There's some variation in that, of course, but it's kind of that, that image of, of linearity. So when we talk about, like I said, this, this regeneration, this kind of circular economy, this image of you know, the classic recycling symbol where everything gets you know, returned into the same sort of system, um, it's all a very kind of beautiful and poetic story, but in you know, practicality, it's not always uh, as easy as that, right? So a lot of the time it looks a lot more something like this. We're not talking about this perfect kind of closed loop when we're talking about circularity. We're talking about finding little ways along that linear chain where we can kind of save things and bring them back to the top. So having these kind of smaller feedback loops along that journey, rethinking about the things like the waste that, that, you, that you achieve at the end, maybe that can be turned into um, a starting resource for another industry or at least just used to, to some fuller extent than just being kind of thrown away into landfill or, or thrown out into the air or whatever that may be. And oftentimes it actually looks a lot more like this. So it actually gets very, very complex when you really start to break it down. So this is kind of what I mean. You know, we have this, this image of maybe what sustainability should be, maybe these buzzwords around what it should be kind of in practice. Um, but as I'm sure most of you know, if you work in the industry or if you're, you know, have ever worked in the industry, um, all of this is going to be way easier said than done. So when we're looking at this in kind of a larger scale, it's actually going to be a lot more complicated and trying to basically find all those little ways that we can get that waste out of the system um, and kind of redesign it or, or redo processes to, to incorporate that. Okay, so that's a little bit of context on, on like I said, kind of where uh, we try to define sustainability and some attempts at kind of defining that in practice. Um, so essentially, what have we done with this kind of ill-defined task? Obviously, we have made progress in a lot of different ways um, with sustainability and food service. It's not the same industry that it was um, decades ago, um, which is fantastic. And, you know, something in and of itself to be extremely proud of. So kind of where are we sitting and, and what have we found in, in our own conversations with you, with our operators? Um, what, what are we, you know, focusing on a lot of the time? So um, looking a little bit quickly at the, uh, the research in the industry, um, so we found that a lot of early studies in kind of the academia realm tend to focus on the development of kind of policies and green consumerism and managers kind of environmental attitudes. So a lot of it was looking at perspectives um, and policies around uh, what green in restaurants mean and what sustainability in restaurants means. Um, the restaurant industry has also faced a lot of pressure, both from consumers and from employees, um, especially in more recent years to try to kind of adapt to that more green or more sustainable mentality. Um, and we've also found uh, kind of resoundingly that there's this lack of a holistic picture of sustainability. So, so what that means is there may be certain initiatives that some you know, operators are um, really hyper-focused on and other initiatives which we just don't talk about as much as an industry. Um, and some areas that you might not even consider are areas that we could improve on as well. So like I said, some areas that we have made progress in are things like single-use materials, waste reduction, and energy awareness. In particular, um, if we think about, you know, the plastic straw movement, which, you know, there's some controversies over, but, but we think about how there's this kind of um, media attention and kind of hyper-awareness of, um, of packaging materials that consumers tend to see and receive. Um, so we get a lot of, of, of that kind of attention from operators because we're seeing that communication from guests a lot of the time, that they're, they're looking for alternatives as well. Um, in terms of waste reduction, so in particular, there's a lot of buzz kind of around food waste and just generally being more conscientious of waste that comes through the system. Um, and also energy awareness. I say awareness, not so much reduction, because there's, there's generally a lot of conversation of people who um, pay attention to, to perhaps their energy expenditure, but not so much on, um, you know, there isn't, there isn't just a lot of information on how to actually reduce that. It, you know, they're very... Um, energy intensive businesses, restaurants, and it's very hard to try to find ways to, to remove that, right? You're expending a lot of energy regardless of, um, of what type of restaurant you're going to be. So just kind of looking a little bit at, um, the, um, at each of those categories and why it's so important to kind of focus in and continue to dial in on each of those areas. So packaging is the largest contrib uh, contributing sector to plastic waste in Canada. Um, 
So Canadians throw away over 3 million tons of plastic waste every year, and only 9% of that is recycled, while the rest ends up in our landfills. So talking again about that kind of conversation of um, circularity, we're not talking just about recycling, and we're not talking just about sustainability, but of finding ways to kind of reincorporate things back into a system. Um, so we're not ending up with all of that waste in the end. Um, in terms of food waste, so um, I talked about that category of waste reduction in general. Food waste in particular, um, I've put a, a couple of statistics here just to kind of represent where we're seeing food waste and just also the impact that reducing food waste can have on the business. So um, 4 to 10 percent of food uh, purchased in-house tends to be wasted, where 30 to 40 percent of food served never gets consumed. So really focusing on kind of that customer end of food waste, so plate waste, um, and finding ways to kind of reduce that through ways of portion size, um, or maybe finding ways to kind of um, cater to, to um, I guess, wants and needs with, without uh, going, you know, way overboard with, with the amount of food that we're serving. Um, so uh, $162 billion per year um, is lost in food waste, and that was in North America. Um, and every $1 spent on food waste could see an $8 return. So if we're talking about that kind of ROI of food waste, um, just to give you a perspective on how much money we're actually pouring into those sorts of things. Um, also in terms of energy awareness, as I said, restaurants um, are often the most uh, energy intensive commercial buildings, which makes perfect sense, right? We're cooking food all day at all hours of the day most times. Um, so finding ways that we can actually cut those um, corners and kind of reduce that waste that's coming out the other side without obviously impacting the business. Um, and utilities are also some of the highest costs that operators face. So trying to find ways, of course, to, to find that ROI as well within that conversation too. So as I said, there's been improvement in a lot of different areas, but ultimately um, there's still a lot of things that we're trying to tackle in this issue. As I mentioned earlier on, there's um, not so much of this kind of holistic perspective a lot of the time with different, um, uh, with different operators and trying to find the ways that we can kind of tackle those areas that are less focused on. So meal production is responsible for 80% of deforestation, 70% of the consumption of fresh water, 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, um, and it's often acknowledged as uh, one of the least sustainable um, among economic sectors. Obviously, this is a very broad general statement. Um, and uh, this is just kind of, you know, as a, as a gentle reminder of why we focus on these things, why we have these conversations, um, is because it's an industry where we have the potential to make a lot of, of difference and a lot of impact. Um, almost half the global population eats away from home every day. And dining out is a popular pastime for most Canadians, and it also makes a really significant contribution to the Canadian economy. So all of these things to say um, that this really allows food service operators to be in this unique position to um, influence the behaviors of their guests and kind of likewise be influenced um, by, by guest behaviors as well. Um, we're one of those industries where we, you know, as an operator actually get to see the customer with their end product immediately before our eyes. Um, so it's really easy to have those conversations with guests to see what they're looking for in a sustainable establishment and, and to be able to make that influence on them. If you are, you know, really focused on these sorts of things, being able to have those conversations with them as well um, and encourage them to, you know, make those changes in their own lifestyle too. So looking now um, at the research, as I mentioned, this, a lot of this has been kind of setting the context um, on the research that, that myself and Rebecca and, um, have done over the last uh, couple of years. So um, in particular, I, I personally looked a lot at barriers. Um, I know, like I said, I have worked in the industry. Um, there's a lot of kind of logistical operational barriers to trying to do a lot of these things. And it's all well and good to say, um, you know, have no food waste and have no single-use plastic waste and all those great things. Um, but there's obviously going to be a lot of, you know, physical things that are standing in the way and why people can't do this. So I focused a lot on what those barriers were and in having conversations with a lot of operators, understanding where some people are overcoming those barriers um, and where we're still really struggling to, to move forward. So the barriers generally for implementing sustainability initiatives, um, I find cost always tends to be the first one. Um, it's a very low profit margin business. I don't have to tell you that. Um, so, so, you know, overcoming that barrier of cost and a lot of the time that mentality of trying to wait to see that ROI can be really challenging. Um, accessibility to programs. This varied a lot depending on where the operators I spoke to um, uh, were, were situated. So someone in Toronto might have access to a lot of different, you know, sustainability programs um, versus someone who's living in, you know, rural Ontario. Like there's going to be a lot of, of difference between those. 
Um, supply chain challenges, a lot of this had to do um, with the pandemic, but also just in general, trying to you know, work with suppliers and trying to find solutions that way. Uh, the physical size of the restaurant group. So most of the research that I conducted was with small to medium sized enterprises. And a lot of those conversations centered around advantages and disadvantages of being that kind of business. Um, so sometimes you have advantages depending on you know, where your munis municipality tends to be, maybe having ownership that's a little more feet on the ground and cares about the initiatives that you care about. Um, but at the same time, if you're not a larger corporation, maybe you don't have the same access to capital, the same access to, to resources, the same access to training programs. So depending on the size, that can have a lot of different barriers as well. Um, the municipality in which you're situated, I mean, does your municipality even compost, right? That's a huge barrier uh, in and of itself. I um, mean, can you set up a system like that? Do you have the capacity for it or the labor for it? Uh, supplier packaging in particular, um, it's all well and good to have your own, you know, compostable packaging or to eliminate takeout packaging. Um, but ultimately, it kind of depends a, a lot on, on what's coming into the establishment as well through kind of that back of house. Um, so this physical space in the restaurant or building, I had some conversations about restaurants that don't compost or don't recycle because they don't have a holding spot in which to keep that until the next collection day because there's just such a small facility. Um, COVID-19, of course, I don't have to tell you that that's been an intense barrier over the last two years. Um, and I'm very aware as well that conducting research with, with restaurant operators over the last two years has been a very um, unique <laughs> space in which to have these conversations. And it's presented a lot of additional challenges um, that maybe we were overcoming before the pandemic occurred. Guests needs and wants is a very big one as well. I'll talk more later on about um, just how drastic that impact of guests needs and wants can be. Um, behavior change of employees. So sometimes, um, you know, you can have all the best intentions and processes in place, but actually getting your employees to day to day go through those processes and procedures can be challenging. Um, and then being overwhelmed by decisions. There's a lot of different ways to start with sustainability. Um, there's a lot of different directions that you can go, a lot of different things you can focus on. And just as I said at the beginning, a lot of people don't even know what it is or how to define it. Um, so, so being able to, um, you know, kind of navigate that space can be really overwhelming as well. So zooming in in particular on one initiative, so I did do my thesis work on uh, single-use plastics in particular in the back of House of Restaurants. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, I won't touch on this for too, too long, but I just wanted to do kind of a quick overview of how many barriers a lot of people find for even implementing one particular initiative, which is trying to reduce single-use plastics just in the back of house of the operation. So this is cost, lack of time, working with suppliers, no available alternatives, health and safety concerns, change management, food quality, optimizing storage, and breaking habits. So those were the main barriers that everyone said, this is why this is so, so hard to do. And that's for one category of kind of one area of sustainability initiatives. So what I want to make sure that I'm, I'm talking about today is in having those conversations and, and most of the research, well, all of the research that I did was, was interview based. So I was able to kind of elaborate with, with everyone that I spoke to on, on, on what they are doing, what they're finding challenging, what they're finding uh, easy. Um, was I made sure that we also talked about solutions. So what some people are, are finding is really helpful for them to kind of move that needle and move things forward in their own operation. Um, so a really big one uh, through, through all the studies that I did was building influence relationships with suppliers. A lot of people found, um, as I was saying, you know, it can be all well and good to, to have um, all of those things in place that you want and need to do. Um, but a lot of it depends on where you are getting your food from, where you're getting your, um, even things like uh, cleaning chemicals, where you're getting your furniture from, right? So, so trying to align um, with similar values with people who are your suppliers. Um, oftentimes this is easier said than done. And we also had this conversation around um, length of time that your establishment has been around can have a really big impact on how much influence you can have with your suppliers. Um, you know, uh, size of your establishment has a really big impact on those sorts of things as well. Um, but it came up a lot in conversation that building influence relationships with suppliers or just building, you know, having those conversations, where did you get that fish? Where did you get that asparagus? What's the process? Could we maybe bring this in in a, in a crate instead of bringing it in, you know, bubble wrapped in six different layers? Um, you know, having those conversations kind of feet on the ground has been really helpful for some people. Um, breaking the habit of reliance on standard processes. So generally, as you know, a bigger question, this is just kind of asking why a lot of the time that you're doing things. So a lot of people found success 
um, in eliminating certain unnecessary waste or kind of designing out waste of their processes simply by asking, you know, why are we taking all these steps? Are these things that we're doing actually beneficial? If we did this one step instead, is this going to, you know, change the process? So, so kind of taking a step back and, and looking at, at where they could incorporate um, changes to those processes or, or eliminating things that don't necessarily need to be done. Um, communicating and marketing initiatives to guests for improved ROI. So obviously, like I said, it's a low profit margin business um, where a lot of people found that they could justify more implementing a lot of these sustainability initiatives and to kind of address that cost barrier, which is so huge, um, is to kind of shout about it, basically. So to talk, you know, take people on that journey on, over Instagram or um, you know, to, to show people like, the changes that they're making in the establishment, to, to just have that communication ongoing so that, um, so that their guests are actually saying, wow, I want to support this business because that's something that's valuable to me. And in the research we find with Generation Y and Generation Z in particular, um, they are more and more motivated to, to support businesses that align with their values. And they're also more and more inclined to, um, to find sustainably focused businesses valuable. So, so making sure that you're aligning with kind of that next generation of consumers and them being able to see what you're doing uh, makes a really big difference to things like sales and, and kind of being able to justify that, that implementation. Um, measuring initiatives to track progress and create goals was also something that, um, that we, I talked about a lot in these conversations over the last two years. So just in the sense that um, measurement, if, if you're not measuring and kind of tracking and trying to make targets and goals, a lot of people don't really know where they're at with, with sustainability. Um, they don't really know what they could improve on. They don't know where they're trying to go. Um, so just being able to assess better what you want to do starts with measuring what you're doing currently and kind of setting targets to progress. And I want to talk um, a little bit more about measuring initiatives in particular because measuring itself can have barriers wrapped up within it. So I also talked with people about the barriers to measurement in itself so we could kind of narrow in on that and try to figure out how do we, okay, in, in, implement measurement systems so that you can measure and create goals and you know, further track those things as well. So some of the barriers to measurement we talked about were um, changing staff behavior. So I talked about this as well, which is things like process changes. How do we actually you know, get staff to, to do these things that we want to happen? Um, a lack of labor to measure things. So just not having enough bodies to stay at the end of the night to count the garbage bags that left the building. Um, cost again, of course. Uh, time consuming and overwhelming. So again, there's kind of this trend of people just seeing this as a really um, a topic that's too broad and we don't know where to start. And we don't know where to go with this. Um, unreliable measurement practices, not feeling that measurement is important and lack of buy-in from owners in certain cases. So um, not feeling that measurement is important was one that I kind of wanted to focus on because a lot of people also said that they found a lot of success in measuring sustainability initiatives because they were able to kind of set those goals and, and track those goals further on. Um, so just finding that some people felt like, oh, it's, it's probably not the most important thing that we could be doing. I mean, which is fair, you're running a business. Um, whereas other people were saying that this is the, the most important thing that we did to be able to progress our sustainability initiatives. So just looking at that barrier, that kind of mental barrier in and of itself is, is something to overcome. So solutions to measurement, like I said, I don't want to just give you a bunch of problems without giving you some of the solutions that I also had in conversation. Um, so in terms of kind of over, you know, simplifying the system really, is a lot of people talked about kind of uh, more simple uh, uh, track waste systems. So things like literally just counting garbage bags that go out at the end of the night and trying to reduce that number of bags. Um, things uh, like having buckets filled um, at a certain, um, you know, station in the restaurant of whether it's the server station and the garbage that they make throughout the night or um, in the kitchen and the garbage they make throughout the night so they can actually see, you know, it's, it's sitting right next to them and they can see how much waste that they're creating over, over the course of, of the evening. Um, tracking costs and sales for certain items. So measuring, um, for example, your successes on certain items based on maybe how you've explained the sustainability that has gone into the production of that certain item. Um, so some people that I spoke to were able to talk about how much they saw a huge jump in sales if they gave their servers maybe 10 minutes at the beginning of a shift to explain um, you know, a story about the, the chicken in particular and the farmer that came along with that and the relationship we ha they have with that supplier. And just being able to notice how much sales had jumped in that particular menu item was a really nice justification for them to say, okay, the things that we're doing here matter to our guests as well. 
So kind of getting that, that incentive and that return on investment. Um, calculating ROI for any of the initiatives as well. So being able to see if you're making an investment kind of upfront in, in replacing something that's, say, disposable with a more reusable item, um, obviously it's going to be more costly upfront, but understanding, okay, in six months or in two years' time, if that pays off, is that something that's going to be worthwhile to our business long term? Um, and then setting targets for food producers or, or suppliers as well. So again, kind of building on that supplier relationship and, and communicating your own kind of values and goals as well. So I also focused a lot um, through the past two years on learning and kind of how that might have an impact. Obviously, we're, we're today, you know, in an institute of, of higher learning and we're um, kind of passionate about bridging this, this academia and this industry and, and being able to communicate the things that, that, that we've found with, with other people. Um, so another thing that I talked a lot with operators about was, um, was what you... Uh, where you learn information about sustainability, there was this thread of kind of overwhelm and, and where do I start with these things? It's like, okay, well, where do you start? If you're thinking, I would like to reduce the amount of waste in my business, where do you, do you just Google it? Do you go to social media? Do you go to, you know, um, a third party organization? Um, so we talked a lot about that as well. And I found that there's some, some barriers that are kind of common to the entire industry, which is things uh, like lack of physical resources available. So whether that's books or guidebooks or um, helpful podcasts or things that people are trying to reach out to that give them that good kind of high level, how do I implement sustainability? Where do I start? Where's that, that easy guide, essentially? Um, reliability of information. So a lot of people say there's so much out there. Um, how do I know what I'm supposed to be trusting? Lack of government and industry accountability um, and a lack of access to programs in general. Again, this varied a lot between if you were in, say, the GTA or versus rural Ontario. Um, uh, in terms of individual barriers for the operators, so things like a lack of awareness or engagement from their own people, um, the uh, time commitment that's involved in doing the research, obviously it does take, you know, a little bit of time to try to, to understand where you want to start with these sorts of things. Um, again, overwhelm is coming up and then unsure where to begin in, in general. So just kind of maybe looking at it as, as a whole, as a whole entity and not, not being sure where you want to start with that and where to go. So again, reflecting on those solutions to learning. So what some operators discussed were uh, actively involving their staff in the discussion. So again, whether it's that kind of 10 minutes before pre-shift and saying, hey, you know, something I, I think that we should really try to focus on in this restaurant is doing, um, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and maybe there's someone on your team who's really passionate about that and wants to go out and do some of that research for you. Um, open communication with suppliers, again, learning from them as much as possible. Um, ongoing discussion with other restaurants, so learning from each other, you know, coming to things like this, um, being in, in different organizations and different spaces where we can learn from, from um, uh, some operators who are kind of setting that gold standard and who, ha who have found a lot of ways to get around these issues already, you know, talking to them and learning from them and, and building those kinds of relationships too. Um, and then communicating industry needs, government and third party organizations. So I, I found in these conversations a lot of the time there was like, oh, well, it would be super helpful um, if the government had rebates for X, Y, Z, or if, um, or if this, you know, organization was able to put out a guide that explained X, Y, Z. Um, so being able to try to communicate and have those conversations and, and being representative on different boards um, would make a, a big difference as well. Um, like I said, I wanted to touch on, on uh, quickly how um, over the last two years that I've been conducting this research, um, we've all been persevering through an incredible crisis globally. Um, so in, in any um, country that you're tuning in from, perchance, um, uh, you would have experienced some kind of a disadvantage in, in trying to work on um, uh, trying to work on even just having your business operate <laughs> over the last two years. Um, so some things that I, that I noticed, and I did do a study that was particularly about how, how COVID-19 affected these sustainability initiatives, because um, you know, kind of leading up to the pandemic, there seemed to be a lot of momentum in the industry around trying to, you know, it was a big uh, trend and it was something that we were all uh, really kind of pulling together to try to work towards. Um, and rightfully so, once the pandemic struck, it wasn't a priority, which is completely fair. So I had a lot of conversations with people about um, how much that impacted, you know, kind of their, their priorities and perspectives on sustainability as well. So... <clears throat> The main things that stood out in that study was environmental sustainability was not a priority. And I'm going to have a glass of water because I'm <laughs> choking all of a sudden. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> oh. 
Okay. <laughs> I know. Whew, I, haven't, I haven't talked this much. Well, I was at the university fair on the weekend, so if you've ever been to that, <coughs> I just talked for like two days straight. All right. So the main things that we found, environmental sustainability was not a priority. Operational short-term was prioritized over the strategic long-term. Managing your people was the most important thing, so everyone focused most on making sure that their people were okay, which makes perfect sense. Um, and that third-party assistance in times of crisis was really varied. Some people found that it was really helpful. Some people found that they weren't getting the assistance that they wanted or needed. Again, that varied a lot based on where you were, kind of GTA or more rural as well. Okay, so two main things kind of happened over the last two years is that we had to prioritize financial stability. This makes the most sense. Of course, that was everyone's priority over the last two years. Um, it also implemented and kind of renormalized a throwaway culture in the industry. I mean, you think about four years ago or three years ago, when you went to Starbucks, maybe 40% of the people in line were carrying their own mug. We've totally just gotten rid of all of that progress that we've made in a lot of ways. Um, it kind of renormalized, you know, having to dispose of things with the disposable mass and the kind of extra, um, extra use plastics and just generally extra disposables to ensure that things weren't being cross-contaminated, et cetera. And it makes perfect sense. Like I said, nobody knew what to do in the last two years. Um, but those were just kind of the two things that we noticed that really overtook any of that progress and sustainability initiatives. So one thing that we kind of emphasized in that study was that we need to make our sustainability initiatives sustainable in themselves. So we need to be in a position, I know it's kind of a, a funny sentence, but we need to be in a position where when things go wrong, we can still um, you know, consider environmental sustainability or, or those things are just so ingrained in our processes and systems that um, they aren't the first things to you know, get thrown out the window when, when things do go wrong and when crises occur because they're bound to occur again, right? So uh, this table is an overview of um, a lot of, well, kind of uh, all of the, the research I've done over the last um, uh, couple years in the sense that it gives you a really nice visual on what we pay attention to and what we don't so much. So in terms of sustainability initiatives, they've been grouped into kind of the, the, all of the categories of where you can focus on sustainability in a restaurant. Now, the people that I spoke to um, most everybody would speak about sustainable food or menu design. So things like, you know, getting, you know, local food, focusing on things like, um, you know, having farmers in the area that are supplying their menu, that sort of conversation and focusing on talking about that with their guests as well. Um, disposals was the second most popular category. So things like takeaway materials. So, um, you know, things like coffee cups and plastic straws and, um, uh, takeout containers of any kind. Um, then employees was the second most important category. They focused on, um, you know, they would kind of talk about the sustainability of, of their staff. And Rebecca will speak a lot more about sustainability in a social sense. Um, but generally, that would come up next most popular. And then kind of as that trickled off, a few people talked about energy, some about social initiatives. And um, next to no one would kind of mention things about, say, gas or furniture and materials or chemicals and pollution. Um, which again makes perfect sense, and and we talk about how um, you know you see this trend of, of these three categories of initiatives have a very strong kind of customer focus or they're customer facing. So they're things that our guests are going to be able to see what we're doing. And when we talk about that kind of trend towards um, you know towards the the next generation really wanting to have that that value based business and wanting to spend their money at that local value forward business. Um, to get that ROI that we're looking to have, of course, we're going to be focusing on sustainability initiatives that our guests can see, right? And that, that we can kind of brag about and talk about and show them that, that this is what we're doing. Um, so this was one thing that we found is really the main focus or, or has been the main focus over the last few years um, is, is, you know, focusing on those customer facing initiatives because those are the initiatives that, that we can, you know, ensure that will at least um, maybe increase sales or increase customer retention or something like that too. So essentially, kind of all that to say, where do we go from here? <laughs> I'm getting the one minute, so I'll try to wrap things up. Um, uh, so if you are an operator, focusing then, kind of looking at that last table, focusing on those out-of-sight initiatives, 
Um, focusing on measuring initiatives, like I said, some people saw that as, as a barrier, kind of a mental barrier, is that it might not make a big difference, but, but a lot of people found it really valuable in kind of moving forward. Um, thinking in circularity, so that concept we discussed at the beginning about designing out waste. And then if you are an industry representative, thinking about accessibility to evidence-based research, so making sure that people can, can trust your, your um, you know, research or guidelines that you're putting out there. Um, incentive to act more sustainably, so trying not to make profit the only incentive for a business, it tends to be the case. So trying to find ways that you can you know, um, you know, subsidize or try to support businesses to, to have other incentives aside from um, just the profitability. And then more clear definition and guidelines on what it means to be a more sustainable restaurant. So like we said at the beginning, we don't really know how to define it and we're trying. Um, and lots of people, lots of people in this room have made incredible progress on what that's supposed to look like and have been able to give us really clear examples on what that could be. Um, but continuing to kind of move that needle forward and continuing to, um, to, to form that definition kind of collectively, both with industry and academia to try to, to, try to make that vision come to life. Um, so I know I'm supposed to be done. So um, I'll just put up the last slide as a list of resources to kind of help you move forward that I've uncovered that a lot of people, you know, in this room even have used to kind of help support in some of these different areas of initiatives as well. Um, and I'm sure this can all be shared with you afterwards too. So anyways, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I forgot to mention that Emily is our academic advisor and food education manager at um, uh, the School of Hospitality Food and Career Manager. So just to give you full um, recognition there, and thank you so much, Emily. And if we have time at the end, we uh, have some questions for Emily or down at the reception later. Please feel free. Uh, Emily will be able to answer your questions. Uh, another person I just want to recognize that I forgot earlier was uh, Chef B.J. Nair from hospitality services at the University of Guelph, and, and having a, a restaurant project that's about sustainability um, would be very hard at the University of Guelph if our food service and hospitality services wasn't so progressive in trying to push the needle as far as sustainability goes. So it's a real pleasure to have your work on campus. It's something that inspires us and it's something that keeps us being able to move forward. So thank you for all you do, Chef. And um, I'm going to introduce now Rebecca Gordon, and I will tell you her title. Uh, she is the Anita Stewart Memorial Food Lab Manager, and uh, her thesis was on um, extreme work, which she will tell you about, and plus we've been working on several other projects on uh, restaurant work and uh, mental health issues like that, and Rebecca has incorporated that into her pre presentation. So I'll turn it over to you now. Yeah, that's great. Um... Just one thing, Elijah, can you just make sure that the audio is working and just give me a thumbs down if I need to change anything. It's so hard, well, it's a new normal, figuring out this like hybrid mode where we're streaming out line and then you have this, it adds a little extra logistical thing. But I am so excited to be here today. Um, so I think I've probably been to every UGSRP symposium and for me as a student, they were really inspiring. It made me think about different things that um, you know, you should be thinking about when you're working in a restaurant. And then when I was actually managing a restaurant, it would um, highlight different things that I needed to be doing more of. And so it's kind of surreal that I'm now talking here. <laughs> Bruce had to like give me a little pep talk, like you're qualified. <laughs> so, um, so I really hope that you're able to get something from this presentation today. So I'm sharing a lot of research that I conducted over the last two years on a few different studies. So one of them looking at um, tourism and hospitality employees through the summer who were just doing in seasonal positions. And then a much larger study which looked at restaurant managers and the characteristics of the job that they had. And I'm kind of combining all these different findings I've had to share with you um, what I've been able to find takes place in restaurants and some ways that we can help motivate our managers to stay and workers stay in the restaurant industry. So just a little bit of a background. So I, anytime I see any kind of report or article that comes out and it's focused on restaurant workers, I always question where is this information coming from? And you, everyone has their, their own 
opinion and reason for saying things. So I need to be upfront with you and let you know where this information is coming from. So in restaurants, I've probably worked most roles except for that of like a chef. Um, and then I've also done advocacy, advocacy work with the Canadian Restaurant Workers Coalition. So um, I've spoke to a lot of politicians, the Senate, um, really advocating for worker rights. And then, as I mentioned, I've done a lot of different research as well, um, whether it is in the academic setting, but also organizationally through the Canadian Restaurant Workers Coalition. And in the last two years, I've probably had hundreds of conversations with restaurant workers. So that's where I'm drawing all this information from that I'm sharing with you today. So just so you know where we're headed in this conversation, so I'm first of all just going to go a quick little background on the issues. You don't really need that because you work in the restaurant industry. But then I'll share some of my results from my studies, and then I'll talk about maybe some ways that we can try and help uh, restaurant workers thrive. And I do want to mention as well that I could probably talk about this topic for like a whole week. And I'm trying to cram everything into a 25-minute presentation, so I'm missing out on huge chunks. So my focus is really looking at the stress and intensity um, in restaurant work. Um, so just to keep that in mind, I know I'm missing things. <laughs> so looking at the issues, so restaurants have a retention problem, and we've known that. It's been an issue. We've been talking about it for, I think, decades now. But just so that you can see here, so in 2015, um, restaurant managers were found to have a turnover rate about 30 to 40 percent in a year. In 2018, Restaurants Canada did a survey of restaurant operators, and they found that, you know, training and recruitment is one of the biggest problems that is facing restaurant operators. Then we hit the pandemic, and in 2021, uh, Restaurants Canada did another report, and we found that it is very challenging to be able to fill roles. So, for example, um, they reported that 54% of restaurant operators are finding it difficult to find managers to work in their restaurants. And then in 2022, just this past summer, Statistics Canada put out a report that said that two-thirds of restaurants say that they're currently facing labor challenges. Okay, so before we kind of get into like what is it that we need and what's, what are the issues, let's first of all talk about what is like that perfect ideal job. And that's a trick question because it's going to be different for every single person. It's all based on your values and your needs at the time. But there is this concept called decent work. And so it was created by the International Labor Organization, and it's been adopted by the United Nations as a, as a right that every worker should have around the globe. And it's um, been incorporated into Sustainable Development Goal 8. And this decent work concept has four pillars. So the first one is providing a fair income. The second one is having job security and having social protections, like for example, like paid sick days. Then there's prospects for personal development. And then our, the fourth pillar is a freedom to express your concerns, the ability to organize and be part of unions. So those are four things that um, the International Labor Organization believes every single job around the world should have. Are we there? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> So what does restaurant work look like? Again, I don't really need to tell you because most of you are currently working in restaurants, but you know, it has a reputation of requiring really long hours of work, especially if you are a restaurant manager. Um, you typically have to uh, sacrifice your work-life balance. You're working weekends and nights when the rest of the world has time off. Um, Restaurants can be understaffed, so you're stuck holding a lot of responsibilities. You maybe are juggling multiple roles. And then it's also very physically and emotionally demanding. So a lot of my presentation today, I'm kind of talking about restaurant managers and long work hours. But I do want to mention that some hourly employees are actually underemployed. So they're looking for those full-time hours, but they're only getting part-time. And that's the nature of restaurant work a little bit. So um, you get cut from your shift it's, if it's a slow day. Um, it really depends on demand. Sometimes operators will bring on extra staff so that they have coverage during the busy Christmas season, all these kind of different things. And um, that means it's really hard for some hourly employees to be able to predict what their income will be like. Okay, so I talked about the decent work concept. Now I'm gonna talk about the extreme job concept. So this is what I prim primarily did in my master's degree was looking at extreme jobs. And so it is, um, again, another concept 
Um, this one isn't tied to the International Labor Organization, but it's been, uh, since 2006, it's been a concept that has been used to measure a variety of different jobs. Um, so looking at, um, I don't know, some like professional roles, um, looking at um, but police is considered an extreme job, working in the military is an extreme job, uh, doctors in ER departments, those are all things that are like you think, oh, stressful, life and death kind of thing. But we were able to find that restaurant management is also an extreme job. And the reason for that is to be able to define what is an extreme job, uh, you have to be working over 48 hours of work each week. And then you need to have five out of the 10 extreme job characteristics um, present in your role. So I have those 10 characteristics here on the, um, on the screen, and I'll dive into them a little bit more closely. But um, really, they look at the hours of work, um, how unpredictable your work is. Basically, the more of these characteristics that you have, the more stressful your job becomes, the more intense it is. So really, we want to be removing some of these things so that we don't have that high-intensity role. So these, these are just the results that I found from my study. So I have the 10... Um, characteristics there. And so those ones with the green check marks are the ones I found the majority of my study sample experience. So 73% of managers that I interviewed are working over 48 hours each week. I actually found that quite a few managers in their contract say that they have to work a minimum of 50 hours. They also have to sign waivers as well too, that they will not be paid overtime pay and um, that they will, you know, or we have to work upwards of 60 hours a week. Then, so there's two characteristics that every single manager I interviewed experienced. So that was unpredictable workflows. Well, like that's kind of duh. <laughs> of course, that's going to happen in restaurants. There's that high demand. But then there's that mentoring and recruitment responsibility. So that was something that takes up a lot of time for managers. You're constantly, especially when you have a labor shortage, you're constantly looking for new people, you're constantly training, um, and it, it takes up a lot of worry and concern, even just when someone calls in sick, trying to schedule someone. Uh, but then there's other characteristics like fast-paced work under tight deadlines, which was common. Um, a lot, a lot of other characteristics that are common as well for managers, like having to be responsible for profit and loss of the restaurant. Um, but the one thing that I really want to highlight is responsibility that amounts to more than one job. This was really interesting to me because I felt like maybe this was like a pandemic thing, but there were a lot of managers that mentioned that they were working two full-time manager roles. And maybe it's because it was the pandemic, um, but it kind of sounded like it might be more of a long-term thing. So I want to give you an example. So we had someone who was the director of operations for, for their restaurant group, but they were also the general manager. Or we had someone who was working as the bar manager and the general manager. There was even one person who was the chef and also the general manager and basically was the only manager in the, the whole restaurant, which was a, a very busy and large restaurant. So people are taking on a lot of responsibilities and you know that lengthens their time of day that they're in the restaurant and they're working. It adds extra stress and there's less people to be able to spread around the workload. So that's something we can really improve on. Okay, so another part of my study was trying to figure out why are people working long hours? Is it because they're being demanded to do that or are there other things at play? So I was looking at different motivations for why people are working these long hours and taking on a lot of responsibilities. So there's two types of motivation. There's controlled motivation and then there's autonomous motivation. Controlled motivation is when you're doing things based on the reward that you're gonna get from the outcome. So there's external motivation. So those are things, uh, I have descriptions here on the slides like of examples that I heard from different restaurant managers, but feeling like you need to work um, really long or take on two roles so that you can save money on labor costs um, and then you can meet your bonus target or meet your sales demands. Um, so you're working, because you're thinking of that end result reward, um, versus maybe doing that role because it's something that you really enjoy and want to be doing. And then that er internal motivation is usually um, like that feeling of guilt. Like if you were to leave the restaurant, how will it survive without me? 
Um, a lot of people mentioned that they're really anxious, and so they're worried that something could go wrong on their day off, so they're constantly on their email checking in, um, or, uh, yeah, just they need to be present in the restaurant the entire time the restaurant is open. So that all kind of is trolling people to put up with these long work hours. And then, so I mentioned autonomous motivation, and that's actually what we want to be seeing managers have. And so that is more doing something because you want to do that. Um, you are interested in it, and you've got enjoyment, and you see value in it. So it was really common. I would hear from managers, like, what kind of like, personal value do you see in, in working long hours or working in your restaurant, taking on responsibilities? And most people said it's because they love being able to be a mentor to their staff. They love being able to watch them develop. That's very rewarding to see someone be able to grow and they want to make sure that they're giving them that support. And then the other thing that was interesting, which probably isn't all that surprising to you, but there's that intrinsic motivation. And that came from people love the thrill of a busy, chaotic service. They love that adrenaline rush you get from that. And they love um, just this feeling of satisfaction that you survived at the end. Yeah, <laughs> I can hear people laughing because it's relatable. So the big takeaway, though, from this is, so I have on uh, the right-hand side of the screen, controlled motivation studies have found, and extreme job studies as well, have found that that leads to, over time, uh, an increased intention to quit your job, exhaustion and burnout, uh, low morale in the restaurant, substance abuse, um, and strained relationships with friends and family because you're not really spending time at home here at the, at the restaurant. But then autonomous motivation, we're seeing a lot more positive things come out of it. So you see higher work engagement, more organizational citizenship, um, and improved health and well-being. So again, we really need to try and reduce the amount of controlled motivation that our workers are feeling so that we can take away all those negative things that are so common in the restaurant industry. And we really need to start putting more effort into trying to figure out how can we get that autonomous motivation. So to get more autonomous motivation, um, there's self-determination theory. And it explains that to achieve autonomous motivation, you need to have your three basic needs met. And those three needs are autonomy, relatedness, and competence. So through all my different discussions I've been having with people, um, when I talk about autonomy, 73% um, of managers were really happy with the freedom that they have with their decisions and um, felt like they have, have a say. But then hourly employees mentioned that they really get kind of told what to do. Again, that kind of makes sense. They're, they're not the ones directing the restaurant. But they don't feel safe to speak up if something is wrong or they might have an idea of a better way to improve something. Um, so we really need to make sure that we're providing um, a way for our hourly employees to provide feedback and also to actually listen to them and um, and implement things because a lot of people said oh I'll mention something and then no one does anything so what's the point so that's something we need to pay attention to and then for relatedness so that's like a sense of belonging so some a lot of managers mentioned that there's like maybe some strained relationships between their executive teams or their ownership um, they feel like a lot of decisions get made at the top and they're directed down and they maybe don't agree with them or it doesn't make sense why they're doing certain things and these people are making decisions who aren't in the restaurant. So that's just something to be aware of, that maybe if you're an owner of a restaurant, maybe um, you need to think, maybe, maybe you don't have the best, as good of a relationship as you think, and making sure that there's those open lines of communication. And then, uh, again, seasonal employees, they were saying that they really felt like they kind of get the short end of the stick a lot. Um, they've had managers come to them and say, I'm not going to give you full-time hours because you're not sticking it out past the summer. You don't deserve that. And so that really um, makes, when I've talked to these workers, they really don't want to be in the industry again because they feel like they weren't respected. And then that last basic need is competence. So 73% of managers reported that they have the skills to do their job. So that's a good thing. But they all mentioned that they don't feel like they're doing their job well enough or as well as they could be. And that's because they're being stretched too thin. And I think that's, that's really sad to hear. They have all these skills. They have all this potential. 
but they're not able to, to get there. So, you know, again, we need to find a way to be able to make that happen. And, I, and that's really, I think, hiring more people so we can spread that workload. People can dedicate the time and the effort that they want, and they can feel better about the job that they're doing because they, they're not being stretched too thin. And then hourly employees uh, mentioned that they feel like they need more training. So quite often they're just kind of thrown in. They might have one training shift. I heard a lot this summer that um, employees were being trained by someone who was trained the week before and like no one knew what, was, what they were doing. And so we need to make sure that we have really strong training programs. And I know that it is so hard when you don't really have staff and you just need bodies, but um, we need to do that. And then we also need to make sure that it's happening continually. So some employees that I've talked to, they um, feel, feel like they had a really good training program at the beginning. But then when it gets really busy, they're coming up into these different problems. They don't know how to approach them or they want to feel like they're growing throughout their, their time in, the, in their employment. So they want to be kind of pushed and challenged and learn. So just like why, do, why is it that we need to think about extreme jobs and extreme characteristics? Why, isn't it, why is it important? And the big thing is that um, it will really impact long-term motivation to work in the restaurant industry. So 67% of managers reported that um, they've kind of lost the enjoyment of their job due to the, the extreme job characteristics, so specifically the long work hours and too many responsibilities. So they talked about how much they loved their job the first couple of years, they, and they still really love and find it interesting, but that never really getting a break or time off really kind of weighs on them and makes them want to leave the industry. Um, so 50% of managers reported that they do not see themselves working in the restaurant industry long-term due to the hours of work. So, you know, we talk about having a retention problem. For 50% of managers are currently feeling that way, you know, that's going to keep, keep going on. And then 50% of the students that I surveyed this summer um, working summer jobs in the restaurant industry had bad experiences and have decided that they are not going to pursue, pursue the restaurant industry again. So we're just burning and churning through people. So that's not good. We need to do something. So then the other thing that I was looking at was the demanding nature of restaurant work. Because I was trying to like kind of crack this a little bit. And um, I was trying to figure out about the intensity of work. And 80% of managers um, stated that they don't actually want the intensity of their job to be reduced, which I thought was really interesting. But when they thought about intensity, they thought about like that, that thrilling, like some of that chaos that's controlled and uh, crazy busy service. They love that. They love the buzz that's in the restaurant from um, everyone kind of being in a, in a busy space. Uh, they've said that it really helps time go by quickly, it can be challenging, and it can feel rewarding. Um, and then people also said, you know, it's impossible to make a restaurant not intense. You need that to be able to make it an enjoyable experience. So that's pretty interesting. And then, you know, then I was like trying to crack that a little bit more. Um, but 87% of managers actually want the physical and emotional demands of their job to be reduced. So... Really, they said, we, don't, we never really get a break. We need time for our bodies to recover. We need um, time away from, from our team to be not dealing with um, some of the de demands and the stressors of the job. So really, we need to make sure that we're prioritizing, that we're giving people time for, for breaks and time to recover so that those emotional and physical demands um, don't become too much. Okay, so going kind of back to that beginning, so how can extreme restaurant jobs become decent jobs? So the one, one really big thing is that we need to ensure that we're making all of our restaurant work hours less than 48 hours each week. That's number one. And I know it's, it's hard. <laughs> um, so there's different things that we can do. We need to maybe examine our operating hours. I think the pandemic was maybe a good lesson for us. Um, we saw a lot of operating hours change and get reduced for like the first time and maybe show that it is possible. Um, and some restaurants have kind of stuck with reduced operating hours. But that is one way to be able to give restaurant managers a ch chance to actually get a break because the restaurant isn't operating. So can you close for one service? Can you maybe shorten your hours so you're not open until 2 a.m.? Um, so those are kind of some of the things. And then... Um, 
We need to work on reducing responsibility. So how can we do that? We need to be hiring more people. And I know that's hard where the, there's no people to hire, but that's something that we need to work on. But also maybe thinking strategically about what kind of work can you outsource? Uh, I was talking to managers and they said, I just really hate having to clean the restaurant at the end of the day. That just adds an extra hour onto my day. And, I, you know, it's my breaking point. So, you know, maybe we can take that one hour off of their day by, by being able to pay for a cleaning company to come in. Um, we need to also provide fair pay for the amount of work being done. So we talk about living wages, but we also need to make sure that maybe we're paying people for overtime pay. Not making people sign off on contracts saying that they're not going to take overtime pay. And maybe that will give us a little bit more motivation to try and reduce um, the amount of hours that we're doing each day. And then we also need ownership to provide more support to managers. So um, again, when I was kind of talking about the disconnect between ownership and management, and managers felt like they weren't being supported. So maybe that's um, you know getting uh, ownership to agree that you're going to pay uh, an hourly employee a living wage. Um, it's also including managers in decision making, or even just providing mental health um, support and training. And then lastly, we need uh, managers to show respect to workers. And I know, I know most people, you know, everyone has, is trying their best, um, but we really need to provide opportunities for people to provide feedback. We need to listen to it, and then we need to act on it. And we also need to share realistic expectations for the job. So when people are being hired, actually make sure that we're sharing how many hours we expect to be giving them and making sure that it's actually realistic. And then I touched on this already, but providing continual training. So then another thing, so like what can workers do? A lot of workers kind of feel a little bit helpless. They feel kind of trapped. Um, but one of the things that I found really fascinating was when I was interviewing managers, the men are actually trying to negotiate better contracts. So um, setting... <laughs> This, especially kind of our chefs, um, they, but they're setting, you know, I won't work more than 50 hours a week. I want every other weekend off and, and saying those demands. And they're kind of shopping around and finding that best position for them. But I didn't hear, I think maybe there was one woman who kind of has a, had a, a better situation. And that was really just, she said it was because the ownership was really looking out for her. But maybe we need to keep that in mind. And we also need to keep in mind that maybe as women, we need to have more confidence and stand up for us and respect for ourselves. But also maybe we need to keep in mind, you know, if you're in an ownership position or you're someone who hires people, maybe keep that in mind that um, women are less likely to speak up and maybe we need to actually set the standard higher and provide them with, with better, more fair work. And then it's also important to actually reflect on what is motivating to you in your work and make sure that your work is actually reflective of, in that. And then lastly, unions or kind of worker organizations. I know like some people get really scared about them, but, but you know, that's really, if we band as workers, band together, that's the potential for us to be able to see more kind of powerful, widespread change across the industry. And then just a little note, because I know there's going to be people say, I can't afford to do all these things that you're saying. But it's really, really important to be investing in employees. We can't have restaurants without people working in them. Um, I found a couple studies, and, and they said that the average cost to train a new employee is $2,000, and the average cost to train a new manager is $30,000. I would bet it might actually be even more than those numbers because you're not, you're not really thinking about the, kind of the intangible things. Imagine if you were to invest that money into your employees, or not even that much money, as much money as that, you could be sa actually saving money. And then can customers play a role? So that was, when I was talking to managers, that was something that was a little bit up in the air. Some felt, yes, we need customers to be able to be more willing to accept higher prices because to be able to treat our employees well, we need more money coming in. And I think that's 100% true. Some managers felt a little bit uneasy, like customers are supposed to come to a restaurant to have a good time. They shouldn't have to worry about all of this. And, you know, that's also true too. But Customers are the people that really put the pressure on, um, on restaurants, and that's how we really see the change. As with Emily's presentation, and we were looking at the environmental things, it was always customer-facing things that got done first. So 
there's that little side. And then I also just want to let you know, as people who work in restaurants, that there's a lot of customers that are coming to me and they're asking me, where are the good places to work? How do I know a good place is treating people well? And that's really tough. You can't really give a certification to someone, but just know that people, it's on more people's radars. And then just in wrapping up, because I know that I've given, given a little, little notice. Um, you know, I know that it's been a really tough time with the pandemic. You're seeing rising costs in your restaurants, and I know it is really tough. And I know it is hard work to retain staff. But we also need to remember, too, we've, maybe the restaurant industry has had it a little bit too easy. We've had this endless supply of workers. Um, and, you know, it's not really your right to be able to always have workers at, to be disposable. Um, but workers really do deserve um, good quality work. And so that's something we really need to achieve. And I've been seeing a lot of different recruitment trends. And it's looking at trying to find new um, populations or groups of people to attract into restaurants. So I see everyone saying, we need to go to high schools and do job fairs. We need to get more temporary foreign workers in. And we need to get workers with disabilities working. And I think, yeah, that's, that's, that is really important. Um, but that's not going to solve the root problem. The root problem is that we need to be changing the industry and we need to increase our, our standards for good quality work. And then in finally wrapping up, uh, <laughs> really, we talk a lot about how we need to make this industry more professional. And to me, that means making sure that we're providing decent and dignified work. So these are some of the things that I've mentioned throughout my presentation. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, there's a lot of other things at play here and a lot more that we could be discussing and thinking about, but I hope that this kind of got you thinking about a few more things. You want me to go through them? <laughs> okay. I feel like I've already done it, but yeah, so fair pay. So making sure living, living wages and that we're actually paying people for the amount of work that they're doing. So again, that overtime pay. Providing our workers with those kind of social supports, so paid sick days and time to, and paid vacation days so people can actually take a break. Um, it was wild to me during the pandemic when I'd be interviewing different workers and they'd say, this is the first time I've had a break or a vacation in like five years and because they could never take time off. Um, and then we need to make sure that we're actually providing our schedules well in advance to our employees so that they can have a life and prepare and making sure that the schedules are actually accurate. So um, not scheduling someone for a 10 hour shift and then it only becomes two hours. And then we need strong and continual training programs. We need to have um, respectful communication amongst all of our teams. And we, I, keep, I feel like I've been nailing this a lot through the presentation, but we need opportunities for feedback where management can listen and take action. And then we need to create safe and supportive environments where mental health is valued. So that's a whole lot of stuff there. And um, yeah, again, I just hope that it's maybe helped help people think about things a little bit more. Thank you, Rebecca. There's lots to think of. And, um, I think listening to both presentations so far today, the staffing shortages make it very difficult to work on these issues, obviously. That everyone in this room knows that that's very hard to move forward when you're just trading water. Uh, that is when I think my observations, looking at the work these ladies do, that it is critical to change our strategic priorities to that of the internal customer right now. We are not going to be able to have and maintain external customers without internal customers. I think Rebecca just said that. We need to, we have marketing plans for external customers. We have digital media. We have all these things that we spend. We have budgets, etc. We need to move those resources maybe, and this is just a thought for another day, <laughs> we need to put those resources to the internal customer for now until we can get back to to speed and then balance it off again. So thank you very much, ladies, uh, for your presentation, some really eye-opening things. And we're gonna wrap it off with our external presenter today from an organization that I admire and respect because of 
in advocacy and education, free education, um, they are doing for our industry and have really stepped up and trying to make a difference. And I would like to argue that they are making a difference. Um, so Kyle Turley is going to uh, come and speak to She is the corporate chef for Unilever Food Service Solutions and also their uh, ambassador for their Fair Kitchens program and had an amazing cooking class with our students today in this very room. So thank you for that. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Is this, is this on? I think I'm looking this way. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, again, Rebecca and Emily, amazing job, amazing work. I was so excited to see that. And now I can see kind of, you know, this full picture of why you've asked uh, Fair Kitchens to be here today. So as Bruce mentioned, I'm putting on my Fair Kitchens hat today as the North American ambassador. Um, so we are just one of the many movements and organizations that are out there trying to make a change in the restaurant industry that we so, so need, as we know, even before the pandemic hit, but has only been exacerbated by what we've all been through collectively over the past couple of years. So we all know this, and we've especially seen it through Rebecca's presentation, um, is that the food service industry is only going to survive when the people that work in it are thriving as well. So how can we make sure that not only do we change the systemic issues that have been happening in the food service industry that have not made it necessarily the most healthy or happy place to work all the time, although there are some examples of where there are really great kitchens to work in. There's really great businesses to work for. And those are the things that we really need to highlight, we need to learn from and share with each other. And my neck is already, when I was watching everything. Yeah, I should have stood at the back. Um, so why did we decide as a company like Unilever that we were gonna do this? Well, one, we had the resources to do it. It's only our responsibility as one of the larger food manufacturing companies out there who's so engaged with the restaurant industry, this is what we can try to help impact positive change within the industry. So in 2017, we did a global survey. So this was carried out in a variety of different countries to really get an understanding of, is there a consistent issue? Is there consistent problems that are happening in the restaurant industry? And surprise, yes there are. No matter where you are in the world, it seems to be the same problem. And that is, you can see here, people dealing with exhaustion, depression, anxiety. Um, again, not feeling like they're getting any opportunity for career, career progression, um, as well as feeling underappreciated. And you think about this job. I mean, many of us here have worked in kitchens, and you put your heart and your soul into it. It's physically exhausting. It's mentally exhausting. But we do it because we love it. But unfortunately, we're seeing people that aren't willing to do that very fairly um, to really live their passion and to work in the industry. Oh. So again, how do we start making these changes, implementing them, and in a way that we can help support you in the industry to really help make these changes to not only make sure that you're retaining the staff that you want, but attracting them as well. Right, So that's been a big part of it is we're not getting as many people interested and in people that really have the same sort of attitudes that you want to put out there as well. So that's where we started to come up with Fair Kitchens. Catchy name, I know. Uh, so like I said, this is a global movement. We've actually shared a lot of different tools and resources and support. Feel very lucky from around the globe. So we've activated this, of course, in Canada, US, uh, South Africa, UK, the Netherlands. And again, because there's so much overlap, we have so much to learn from each other. And we're very lucky to be able to share that with you today. So I'm just going to show you a quick little video, I promise. Um, just a little bit more about our movement. The issue for chefs is that they've, they've had their, their, the role that defines them uh, just pull from under them like a, like a rope. And I think there's been a real sense of almost grief and loss. The financial constraints have got much harder, um, but I think that, you know, it doesn't cost anything to be kind. So I think that we have to use this opportunity to, to take it as a time to change for the better. Fair Kitchens is a movement 
one that has been created to fight for a more resilient and sustainable industry. It puts the well-being and development of its people at the heart of everything it does. I want people to come to work and be happy. Really, that's the secret, I think, about why customers like it. You know, they, someone says the buzz and the atmosphere, and really, we're nice to staff, and as a result, staff create this lovely atmosphere for, for customers to come into. So as they kind of covered in that, what is our goal with Fair Kitchens to be able to support you out in the industry? It's be able to make that change around the world. Um, it's about to call for change for the entire industry to kind of change some of the more toxic traits that we've had going on and really cultivate that healthy, happier environment for everybody to work in that they want to work in, that makes them so happy to go to work every day, where they feel like they have a purpose and they have a career ahead of them. And it's not just a temporary job that we see so often in hospitality. And of course, raising the standards for the industry as a whole is so important. And it's you know a, sl a slow ship, but I think we're turning it. And I think the more of us that do it together is all the better. So. I just kind of want to let you know about some of the tools that we have available in support. So this is really where it comes down to it. Everything that is offered is free. It's free. It's all available online. Anybody can access it. So this is why I'm so passionate. This is like the best part of my job. Usually I'm talking about mayonnaise every day, but today I'm talking about Fair Kitchens and I'm so excited about it. So it goes into a whole bunch of different buckets and ways to support the team. And we know that there's varying levels within you know, different kitchen environments. So it's really finding what's gonna work for you and your team. So sometimes it's just going to be, how do we start a conversation? Maybe we just need conversation starters to kind of open up that door for you know, team members to feel more comfortable in approaching their team leaders. Um, maybe a team leader doesn't necessarily know how to start the conversation. So there's kind of like these tools where it can help give little like tips on how to jump off and have those conversations. There's other things like sharing real life stories. And I think this is a really big one. Actually, our own Bruce McAdams here uh, did a Fair Kitchens, we called them Take 20s on Instagram. And it's really about sharing real life experiences and understanding what other people are going through. Because I think putting it out there, making it crystal clear, saying, I've been through this too. Uh, really helps people to open up a little bit more. It might not be the only thing, but it does at least help having that conversation. Uh, so that's just one of the things, but we also have a variety of different experts and different modules that people can check out so that they can kind of see what else is going on in an area that might interest them in particular. Maybe there's certain things that are going on within your particular kitchen culture that you find of interest. Um, and then, of course, we have other resources available through, and I, I keep pointing over here, we have Hassel from Not 9 to 5. So other organizations that are doing amazing work where we really want to help share their resources as well, because the more of us that are doing this, the better change that we can make. Um, and then we also have some expert, like mental health experts that share some of their advice and their tools on our site as well. So we have... I think also earlier we were talking about uh, what if somebody doesn't feel comfortable, that emotional part of it as a leader of it's too stressful, there's a lot of communication. This was in Rebecca's presentation. Uh, we also have tools that can help them maybe open up a little bit more with their staff in a way that doesn't feel as frightening or as threatening. Um, so again, just very easy ways to do that. The idea at the end of the day, and we talked about how can customers play a part in this? What does this mean as a business? The idea, now we started this in 2018, was when we launched Fair Kitchens. Then we all know the next few years that happened. So that slowed us up a little bit. But the idea is that we're hoping that Fair Kitchens or something similar will end up becoming something of a recognizable certification. So as people start looking for employers or employees, they can use this Fair Kitchens logo to understand that they fall within the values 
that are kind of identified as being a fair kitchen. Now, this is nothing that will be policed by anybody. All of this is gauged via feedback through employees that work at that business. So it's just their true, honest opinions about how they feel working in that environment. Again, will not only help like-minded people find each other so that you're hiring people that have a similar attitude, but it really could draw more employees into your business. And again, no meal should come at the cost of somebody's well-being. One of the very interesting things that I, well, I had thought about the other day was just, you know, often you'll get customers asking, you know, where did this meat come from? What's the story behind, et cetera? But then very few people think about the people that are preparing their meal. And so that's what this is all about, is taking another look at what's happening in the kitchen. So these are just a few of the things that we've been working on in North America recently, and I'm very excited about it. So one of the areas is around recruitment and retention. And so this all starts with leadership. Starts from the top, that's where we're gonna implement change. So we actually started to put, to, or we have put together uh, training modules where we worked with the Culinary Institute of America. It is seven different modules, all online, all free, 30 minutes each, and they target different areas of leadership. So perhaps there's somebody that you um, <clears throat> promoted into a leadership role that has excellent skills in some areas, but maybe needs to build out others. So that could be hiring practices, crisis management, mental health, um, really easy modules that kind of give them a good grasp on these are some of the key takeaways that would be beneficial for your team to kind of invest in a little bit more. At the end of it, what's extra great is that they actually can take an assessment and then they get a certificate from the Culinary Institute of, Amer Institute of America. So again, it's something that moving forward, you can talk about career progression, something that they can put on their resume, something that they can feel proud of. And it doesn't necessarily need to be those in leadership positions. It could be anybody that eventually wants to be in that role to show how motivated they are. And it could also be for front of house staff as well. So it's a little bit for everybody. Uh, supporting women in the workplace. So we actually put together a group last year of women in the food service industry all across North America, and we wanted to really dig a little bit deeper as to what are some of the barriers that they felt, rather than us telling them, but the barriers that they felt about being in the industry and moving into leadership roles. And so we wanted to focus on women, women of color and women that were mothers that were working in this space and what was stopping them. And the one thing that they really had decided was mentorship is gonna be key. So hearing from other women and their success stories. And the other thing that we ended up doing was creating a survey that is still open right now that people can take and it's for employers or employees. And the idea that we're hoping to get out of it is where are these barriers that are stopping people from potentially promoting women into these leadership roles? Um, and where can, you know, people that, women that are applying for jobs find businesses that will, you know, celebrate them and be able to work with them in finding, you know, maybe flexible working hours if they are a parent, um, all that sort of stuff. So here's a little video from, we ended up calling them We Chefs, so it's Women Empowered Chefs. done to address gender stereotypes in the workplace. I first believe we have to acknowledge that there is a problem, and secondly, that women have to step up and demand and take what is theirs. I believe that in order to eradicate stereotypes in our industry, we need a culture shift, a true transition. Some actions we can take are allowing for a more flexible schedule, tailored roles for both kitchen and higher management, mentorship, and highlighting the great role models in our industry. Make a difference with those stereotypes, make a difference with the workplace culture by bringing that fresh, fabulous attitude to the table. Attitude has so much to do with how you're seen, the flavor that you leave in your scenario, and the mark that you leave on whatever you do in this industry. Uh, diversity and inclusion. 
So this report and this partnership is actually very new for us. We just announced it last week. Uh, so we have partnered with the National Restaurant Association who did a report with Cornell University, and it is around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The idea behind the report, one, was for them to get an understanding of where some of these barriers are and how we can actually help implement um, more practices that can encourage diversity and inclusion in the workplace. So as a part of our partnership, not only are we co-hosting a webinar with them that's coming up where they can actually give you tips and um, guidelines on maybe how we can look at hiring practices as well as retention practices that can encourage this. Um, but we also have different assets with regards to training. So we're very, very happy about it. It's very new for us. Um, again, you're going to see a lot more coming out from this. But we're very happy to, again, join with others that have been doing this really hard work. Rather than recreating the wheel, let's work with the National Restaurant Association who's done all this hard work. I know that it took them a few years to get this all together, uh, but I think really great things are going to come out of it. And I think it's how we're going to implement it and how we can get these resources to you so that you have an easy way to then implement this in your own teams. And then mental wellness, one of the things that's coming up is... Um, I guess, to, in honor of World Mental Health Day, although it's going to be on October 11th, um, we partnered with Restaurants Canada. So we do have a webinar where we're going to talk about different resources that are available um, for your team where you can really check in on them with their mental health and their wellness. Um, again, to make sure that this is something that we're addressing, something that we're continuing to talk about. Uh, and I think it's also going to just be about easy resources how do we take them and use them in a way where people don't feel like it's a burden? Um, and just having that open conversation. And that's it. Thank you so much, Kyla. Um, three amazing presentations. Just one point building on what Kyla said there. I love everything Fair Kitchens is doing, but the focus on leadership is critical. We often hear that culture is the answer, but we have to understand that culture is determined by the acts and behaviors of leaders. So leaders will be the answer. Leaders determine culture. You can't ask culture to do something. Leaders do something and determine culture. So really, one of the things we need to do, and this is a bit of an advocacy point uh, on my part, is to focus and, and develop leadership and, and things will will get better from there. Uh, and also just to echo, uh, Rebecca and I were saying, uh, and Emily earlier, um, what Kyla pointed out, there are many people doing great things, many of them in this room. I look around this room and there's people whose restaurants I've studied who are top notch, and I would want to work for them, I want my friends to work for them, et cetera, et cetera. So we do have the best practices out there, the people that are setting the bar, and uh, I am very optimistic in that coming out of the pandemic, the next few years we'll see a lot of stability coming into the employment labor market, and that will only improve if we continue to focus on strategies for internal customers and retaining, attracting them, and focusing on leadership and investing in leadership development so that those people that are working for us are getting the best possible experience here. And that will determine the culture. You can't just count, count on culture. That's the outcome of leadership and behavior. I think we're going to take two questions from online and to start, and we'll see how time goes. And can you read the questions out? And, we can come up. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, we're aware we've taken up so much of your time already. Um, and so, this will be probably pretty quick. Um, but we just want to address some of the online questions really quickly, and then you can ask us one online for those who are in the room right now. But we did have a question about, uh, someone asked, we avoid food waste if, if excess food is not wasted. What can restaurants do with the excess waste? So that's a question for you, Emily. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, um, yeah, one thing that I talked about kind of why I showed that statistic is generally, I mean, if you're a chef, if you've gone to culinary school, if you worked in a kitchen, um, you are trained not to create a lot of waste. Like you are trained to, you are using 
the carcass of the chicken, you are using the stems of the broccoli, you are trained to, to try to minimize waste as much as possible. Um, a lot of the time where we see most of that waste coming from is on the customer end. So, so some strategies that you know you try to implement in that sense is right trying to try to create that value without um, you know over committing to the amount of food that's going to be on the plate to try to anticipate that. Um, obviously, there's still going to be food waste at the end of the day when your main product that you're serving is food. It's not always all going to get consumed. Um, so I shared a resource at the end. I didn't get a chance to talk about it. It's called Second Harvest. So if you are kind of in, in um, the GTA, especially, um, that's a resource that can actually come and collect. Food that is either leftover or wasted. So we talk leftover food are things that are prepared but can still be consumed, um, or wasted food are things that can no longer be consumed. And finding other places that, that can turn into a resource for someone else. So whether that's being donated to a food bank, whether that's being taken to a farm as feed, or um, at, at you know as last resort composting, anything to kind of avoid that, that landfill, um, and hopefully composting to, to um, you know create energy in another system as well. Yeah, that's great. Okay, and then our, our second and our last question from online um, was how does the new minimum wage and a lack of living, living wage affect retention in the restaurant industry? So obviously that's a question I have to answer. Um, and it's a very complicated one. It's great to see that the minimum wage has increased and I know that makes it more difficult for restaurants to be, their labor costs go up, but that is really important as you see rising costs increase and workers really need to make sure that they're relying on an increased wage but it is still far under what a living wage is for each region. So we need to see that, in my opinion, we need to see that increase even more. Um, and there's a lot of different labor groups that are really pushing for a, at least a base of $20 minimum um, per hour, because people are having a lot of trouble being able to afford their rent, <coughs> being able to afford their medication, being able to afford food, as we're seeing all these other prices uh, increase. And um, so how does that affect retention? A lot of people end up searching for other jobs that are going to pay them more. And then it's also very complicated where I've seen a minimum wage increases and say someone was um, working in a restaurant and they were already, say they were above minimum wage, and then the minimum wage goes up and now they're at par. A lot of times those people don't end up ever getting a raise either. So we need to think about making sure we're fairly um, raising prices of, or wages for everyone. That's it. <laughs> Excellent. And I thank you for those online questions. And we'll take one or two uh, quick questions inside. And then we have uh, wonderful beverages from Wheelbarrow Orchard in Milton. Some great cider and sparkling waters they make. And some lovely local cheeses and meats and, and things down at PJ's immediately after. And, and those of you here will have full access to our speakers as well. <laughs> but maybe there's a question that we can share with those online. Does someone? Have a question that uh, they would like to? Yes. Well, I'll ask one of, of Kyla. And first, I'll start by saying thank you very much for your initiative, Unilever on Fair Kitchens. It's amazing. Um, and thanks for sharing it with us. And I, I, to maybe play off from Bruce's focus on leadership, could, could I ask one level higher about ownership? because there's so little diversity and gender equity in the ownership of restaurants. Is that something that Unilever has focused on in the DEI report? And maybe if I could challenge you to come up with an access to capital initiative, that would help move the need. I love that question. Um, with regards to the DEI report, it's something that we're just accessing now, so it wasn't content that we have created. However, it is a very important um, topic that you're bringing up because, like we had said, females in leadership, but that also goes for ownership. And the comment that um, I believe Rebecca had made before, too, about, you know, being able to ask for more, um, I think plays into that. So there's nothing that we're doing actively right now, but it would be a really good area for us to explore more. Um, right now, we're trying to look at like inside that kitchen space, but of course it's a whole, it's, it's very holistic, it's everything. And we should be looking at everything. And I think it only means better things will happen when we start seeing more diversity at that level will also encourage others that are going into the industry like, hey, this is possible for me. This is something I can do because I'm inspired by this individual. So I think it's the direction that we want to head into, 
There's nothing that we're doing at this moment specifically on that, but in the future, we will make it part of what we're working on. And again, in engaging with other organizations that may also be working in this space. Thank you. Time for one more question. Yes. Um, I think we all agree people should be paid more money, and it's great to pay people more money. Um, we see the, the benefits on the on the employment side. In terms of the employer, um, you know, it's obviously the margin is very small in the restaurant industry. And I think consumers are under a lot of price pressure as well, too, especially that, especially that. Where are, we, where are we going to see success in communicating to consumers? Like, have we seen that success communicating to consumers of why, you know, to dine out somewhere that is, you know, fair kitchen certified or a B corporation or whatever, um, to, to, you know, to get that advocacy towards consumer to support that? Because right now, like I said, it's very difficult in the hospitality industry to even make anyway. Um, so I'm going to start off and I'm going to ask my colleague Rebecca. One, one thing that I think COVID did was it shed a light on the financial ongoings of restaurants to consumers to some point. I think we all noticed in the media and the press, finally coming to the forefront, people understood how people made a living in the restaurant industry. Restaurants were a bellwether for COVID, truly. It was, what's the restaurants doing now? Oh, they're closed, that's not good for us. Okay, now we're opening the patios, now society is feeling a little better. So, so there has been an increase, so I think the environment is, is right, and, and there is um, interest from society for the first time. It's almost like we took the door off the kitchen, or off the restaurant, and now people had a little bit of a peek in, and, and so I think that that's going to help, and I'm gonna pass it. Uh, Rebecca doesn't agree with me, no. but that's fine. I wish I had the answer, I don't. Oh. <laughs> no, so I think, um, you know, the, the pandemic, really, the one good thing that came out of it is that we talked a lot more about the issues in the industry, and I think it was really on the forefront of, of media attention. And it's certainly, um, you know, kind of ruined the reputation of restaurant work, but I think we started having some conversations. Has that kept up? No, not really. So I think we need to continue to have those conversations. We need to be highlighting those restaurants that are doing really great jobs um, and in hopes that it will inspire other restaurants. And then, um, I have a couple more. Okay, I was going to say, I, was gonna, I wish that we could all band together as restaurants. And this is like idealistic, obviously that's never going to happen with the way things work, but it would be really great if we were all raising our prices um, so it became kind of the standard norm. And yes, that would mean people wouldn't be going out to restaurants as much, perhaps. But, um, you know, we need to look at other ways to be able to kind of save costs. But I think labor should be really important. And I think as an academic, looking at the research in this area is very important. And the research is very strong about the relationship between employee engagement, so how committed and how much an employee likes their work, and productivity and retention, okay? Uh, Rebecca gave you the numbers financially about retention, and those numbers are eye-opening. But there's also an increase in productivity, and we only have to go to the breakfast restaurant that I was at this weekend, where they had a server who may, shouldn't have even been on the floor, they were making $15 an hour, and could handle, not handle, one table, because it was their second day on the job, and the whole team was unproductive. Understanding that continuity of staff, that rewarding staff and keeping staff is financially the answer. Being able to pay a higher wage because those people are significantly more productive and they're going to stay longer, those are two cost savings that are, are mediated by that increase. So, so that, that's a lot to get your head around, but I think that's what the research bears out. And uh, I think we'll leave it at that. But it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, this is not only an existential problem issue that we're facing. I've been in the industry 40 years, and 
It's been a labor crisis for 38 of them, and now it's existential. This is about our existence in many cases. It calls for a different way of thinking. We cannot go back to the old ways of thinking, my ways of thinking when I was a leader and manager. The good thing is we have incredible people that showed through the pandemic how creative they can be, how wonderfully they can make things happen. So the answers are there, I'm sure. It's a matter of moving the energies and the focus on those things. It's very idealistic. It's easy for me to stand up here when I have no skin in the game right now and, and say those things. But I truly believe working with le these ladies over the last few years, right, and just speaking and reading all of their transcriptions and their reports, that, that that's sort of where things lie. So let us be convivial and share some some great food and drinks. Thank you to the online uh, participants and viewers. That's fantastic. Those of you who made it here, we truly appreciate your support. It was very important for us to be in person. That's what our world is all about in, in hospitality. And coming back like this and having your support is is inspiring and, and makes will make us want to continue moving forward. All of our research that we've spoken about, or Emily and uh, Rebecca's research, you can get copies of their presentations. And also, they don't know this yet, but they're happy online to have conversations with you <laughs> and continue the conversation moving forward, as I always am as well. And uh, thank you very much to everyone on the team that made this happen. And uh, I hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you down at PJ's for something to drink.